Um, I will try to cover as much ground as I can in the time that I have allotted. I want to make sure that we have enough time um, to have our panel discussion and question and answer session. So I may, for time, uh, go through some of my slides a little bit more quickly than I like, but I hope that with this, it's okay with the audience today. So I want to bring to you uh, my experiences as both a uh, clinician in both family medicine and geriatrics about what I've seen in terms of what the move in, in terms of the, uh, the best teamwork care approach uh, of a loved one with dementia. First one to say is that uh, disclosure, uh, we do this in a lot of our medical presentations, that I do not have any relevant financial relationship to any of the healthcare products that we presented today in today's slide presentation. Another disclaimer as well is that I will be sharing patient stories with you uh, most of them uh, are real patient stories, um, but I've had to alter the uh, demographic and medical details so that the you know, pertinent uh, elder, family, and or caregiver can be identified in case they're in the audience today. I, again, uh, same thing is that my back was to the audience, but how many of you are currently caregivers? Could you please raise your hand again? Quite a number, okay. So I want to sincerely thank each and every one of you for, uh, who are caregivers for all your hard work, dedication, perseverance, love, and compassion that you're providing uh, for those uh, loved ones. Uh, you know, you could be providing care for a family member, a neighbor, a friend, a loved one, and I really, truly thank you for the wonderful care that you provide every day, every minute, and every second. So I'd like to, if you don't mind, I'd like to just applaud you for all that you do. Thank you, thank you. I also felt that in order for me to have a better connection with the audience as well, and since I will be uh, also telling uh, some of the, my interactions and stories with my patients to give you a little bit of snapshot about my sh uh, short story uh, about um, uh, how I got here to UC Davis. Uh, my short story is the following. I grew up in uh, Louisiana, Baton Rouge. I saw a gentleman here with the LSU shirt. Uh, so, great, <laughs> go Tigers. Uh, and uh, made my way west um, uh, to California and uh, did my undergraduate training uh, at UC Berkeley um, where I had actually my first foray in caregiving. I actually was a caregiver uh, in my second year of college uh, for uh, Mr. Matt Kim, he's the gentleman in the middle. Um, uh, as you can tell by the age, didn't have dementia, but he had physical dis uh, disability. He had uh, uh, advanced uh, cerebral palsy. So physically he was disabled, but cognitively he was intact. And he was uh, at Berkeley getting his physics degree at the time. Um, but uh, as uh, his caregiver uh, throughout uh, the four years of undergraduate, uh, I helped attend to his daily needs because he was unable to walk. He needed someone to help with dressing him and taking him to the bathroom and uh, showering him and feeding him. And so I had the privilege of being his caregiver uh, for, for, for four years. And uh, we are still actually uh, good friends uh, as well. And so it's, it was a privilege taking care of him. Uh, also, another thing that was very important about my time at Berkeley was uh, the lovely lady on the, the left uh, has decided to stay with me for the last 30 years. <laughs> So I was very fortunate that in my first day at, at Cal, I uh, met the person that is now my wife. So a great, uh, 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 many, many, uh, many positive uh, aspects about my time at Berkeley. From Berkeley, I moved on uh, to working in San Diego for a biotech a company in San Diego. Uh, I got bitten by the research bug and thought that uh, I was going to uh, go forward towards a career in oncology. And uh, so went to Albert Einstein um, uh, in the Bronx um, and had every intention to being an oncologist. And fortunately, I just uh, found out through my time there that I really didn't like being in the lab and doing my research on mice. And what really excited me was uh, getting to work with people, getting to work with their families. Uh, I, in the cancer research field, I was more interested in learning how family members were coping with the disease uh, during the times of hardship and during the times of remission, and not really so much interested so much in the science of what was happening with their cancer. 
Um, so with good guidance from mentors in medical school, as well as support from my spouse, uh, joined uh, the, my ranks of uh, family medicine and uh, went to Swedish Medical Center in Seattle where I completed uh, my residency training as well as uh, geriatrics fellowship training uh, and completed in 2003. And I have been here at UC Davis now for the past 15 years. Um, through the years as a family physician and geriatrician, I've had uh, the privilege of uh, providing care uh, for the full scope of uh, what family medicine has to offer. That includes delivery of babies, providing care to children, taking care of adults, and also providing care for the elderly in the Sacramento area. Uh, and then as my role as a clinical professor here at UC Davis, uh, I had the privilege of really training the future family physicians, uh, particularly how best to care for our elderly in, in a variety of settings. So that's a little bit of my, my uh, professional life in a nutshell there. So that ends my short story for today and about who I am, and so let's move on to our presentation here. So today's topics are going to be the following. Uh, we're gonna review the dementia care triad and how best the triad can work together in a typical outpatient office visit. Uh, discuss some of the recommendations that you should consider in the daily care needs of your loved one. Uh, introduce the idea, the concept of the dementia care team and identify who should be those potential team members. And then review what are some of the current challenges and future possibilities in the care of the elder with dementia. So let's start off with the dementia care triad and how best this triad can work together in a typical outpatient office. Let's go over some of the statistics of Alzheimer's dementia. We already know about all the complications that are associated with care, but we also know, as you know as well, that having the diagnosis of Alzheimer's dementia actually is in and of itself a terminal diagnosis. If you look at the leading causes of death in the United States, Alzheimer's disease is listed as a sixth leading cause following heart disease, cancer, lung respiratory disease, accidents, and stroke. Currently, someone in the United States every 65 seconds develops Alzheimer's disease. Two-thirds of current Americans with Alzheimer's are women. 16.1 million Americans provide unpaid care for people with Alzheimer's or other dementias, and this amounts to 18.4 billion hours of care, valued at currently $232 billion. I think we all know, though, already, I think about what, this, what I was meaning in terms of the care team triad, right? the dementia care triad. In the home setting and in many current outpatient clinic settings, the, the dementia care triad is the model that we currently use for providing care for the elder with dementia. So who is involved in this triad? It's usually the caregiver, the person with dementia, and the physician or the medical care provider. And so it's this partnership, this, this, this three-team partnership where in many clinical settings that this is the usual partnership that we see. Again, the elder, their caregiver, and a physician or medical provider. But there can be, may, there are many reasons why this partnership doesn't work well. What do you think, though, is probably the most challenging problem in a typical office visit for all members of this triad? Time. Time, exactly. Why, G give me, tell me, what's the problem? What, what, What's, what, what do you mean by time? How long is it? <laughs> right, exactly. Time is the major factor. If you look at recent studies, doctors say that they spend with each patient. In, in the April 2016 Business Insider article reports that doctors spent only about 13 to 16 minutes of face-to-face -face time with the patient, all right? So that's about average of 15 minutes. Now, when you are sitting in your doctor's office these days with your loved one for that 15 minute visit, how much of that time do you think is actually direct patient care? Really low. It's been looked at and studied. Let me see if I can find this, uh, this blurb here I got here. It's been shown that in a 2016 study that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, 
only about 52.9% of the time in the office is actually spent speaking with the patient, the caregiver, and doing the exam. So your 15 minute appointment is actually cut down to eight minutes and 12 seconds. What's the rest of the time, uh, what's the rest of the time um, that the doctor's using? What are they doing? Yes, they're on the computer. They're on the computer, okay. They're on the computer, they're reviewing, the, they're, they're documenting through the visit, they're charting, uh, they may be reviewing the laboratory tests at the time of the visit, they may be re reviewing um, uh, con consultations that were ordered at, at the prior visit. So we have a significant issue of how do we make the most of this precious time? Is there any way that we can move that eight minutes, 12 seconds closer to the 15 minutes? Is there any way in the future that that 15 minutes can be moved to 30 minutes, okay? That's gonna, that latter one's a really hard lift because of the system and how the way uh, medical care is built. But there are ways though that you can learn today about how can you move that time frame so then that you actually have you and your loved one have the time with the doctor and it's not being interrupted by the computer or the documentation, okay? So let me give you an example here. So let's say you're the caregiver of, an, of your mother, she's 82, she's got moderate dementia, has a history of heart disease and osteoporosis and high blood pressure, uh, recently hospitalized for one week at another hospital after having a fainting episode. During that hospitalization, it was determined that the reason why this happened was because the patient uh, had a significantly slow heartbeat that required pacemaker placement. Pacemaker pla was placed, but the hospitalization was also complicated by that person uh, having a seizure. There were several medication changes that were made, uh, and there's also been a note that your mother has been much more sleepy since return home. You are interested in also knowing how to adjust the diet for better management of the high blood pressure. So how should you prepare yourself and your mother for that visit that's happening in two weeks when you know that that visit will only last 15 to 20 minutes, okay? And this is all the things that you as the caregiver know knows what happened. As the physician, what do we know? We know nothing, right? We do not have any idea that all of this has transpired. All these things. Just me reading this, you know, took half of that office visit, right? And this is just a scripted uh, way of summarization of the hospital stay. Because what do we see on our schedule as a physician, or how do you, when you call to schedule that visit, what do you, what do you relate to the scheduler? You're not relaying this whole story, right? right. Right, one priority. So for me as a physician, on my end, I will see patient X, 15 minute appointment, follow hospitalization. That's all I see on my end. I don't see any of this at all. Any of this at all, all right. So currently the recommendations to make the most of the office visit, to prepare for the office visit is the following. Write down and prioritize questions and concerns that you and the elder have. Prepare the medication list. Call to confirm the appointment. My argument right now is that that's the past. That is something that I think, and in some clinics we do this now as well, but that's the past. There are, because if we were to do it this way, as, as mentioned, we would be taking up a lot of time, that precious time during an office visit um, for which you would never get down to why you actually are having that visit in the first place. So what does the potential now, some of this actually now is happening in my clinic now. I believe it's also happening in some of the other clinics in, at, at UC Davis, but also what does that future hold? And that is to really prepare for the office visit is that I've noticed that over the past 15 years there has been a significant and positive changes in making this, in, in how to make the most of the office visit, okay? What do you, what do you think that is? What is that one change? Technology. Technology, okay. Some of you may hate it, 
Some of you embrace it. Some of you have mixed feelings about it. But I have seen the use of a computer or tablet or smartphone really help make this office visit run more smoothly. So using that case that I presented, we'll walk through the steps together about how we can use technology to help maximize the time that you, your loved one, and the care provider can work uh, efficiently as a triad in the 15 to 20 minute slot that you have. So as mentioned already, before the visit, consider emailing or e-messaging if, the, if, the, um, if your health system has a portal. Here at UC Davis, it's called MyChart. To basically send a message to the provider, hey, we're coming to see you in two weeks, and these are, what we, these are the things that we like to talk, we, we want to discuss. And that will prepare the physician to know what is going to be the agenda for that visit. And they can actually even start looking some things up based on what your questions and concerns are. Another thing that we also are starting off at, at, at in our practice in our family medicine clinic is we also have a pre-visit planner, a nurse that will call you one or two days, um, excuse me, one or two weeks beforehand just to say, hey, we know you're coming in for the visit. Is there anything you want to share with us to make it, to make it ready, uh, to make the visit uh, ready for you? So for example, do you want to have labs done before you come to the visit? Do you want to have an x-ray done before you come to the visit? And those things can be ordered up and can be completed prior to the visit so then that when you get to the visit with your loved one, you know what the results are going to be at the time of the visit rather than you know, follow phone calls and such when the test or the x-ray or, or study is done at the visit. You also should be able to, with online portals, be able to review and update the medication list online, either through use of a, a desktop computer, laptop, or tablet. And the other way that you can also uh, uh, confirm the appointment is now you should be able to confirm in most health systems, confirm what the actual appointment time is online so you don't have to call, be on hold, waiting to double check that. You can check it at your own time and your own convenience to confirm when that appointment is. So let's look at this case again. Again, in summary, this is your mother who uh, has, these, who has uh, moderate dementia, uh, heart disease, osteoporosis, high blood pressure, recently hospitalized, has a new pacemaker. Uh, hospitalization was complicated by seizure. Uh, you, several medication changes were made and since that medication, since those changes were made and since the hospitalization, your mother has been much more sleepy since return home. And you yourself have an interest in wanting to uh, adjust the diet uh, for better management of high blood pressure. So using what I've just discussed, what do you think you would, how would you go about doing this? How would you go about providing information? But for this case, this is like a scenario that could potentially work, right? Let's go over this. So you and your mother talk, and you agree on three agenda items that you want to bring up with the doctor. Those three items are include that you both have questions regarding, some of, uh, de uh, regarding the hospitalization. You wanted some information about what exactly happened and what were some of the test results. You both are wondering why she's sleepy. And you yourself are, again, interested in just dietary recommendations. So you actually can message this to the physician, letting them know that this is what you would like, you know, letting, letting them know this is what plans you have for the agenda for that visit. Through the patient-physician electronic portal, you can also update the medication list. As a physician, what would happen on my side would be, I would actually see the message, start preparing for what we need to do. I can have my pre-visit planner call you to say, hey, I understand that you have questions about your hospitalization. Let's work together to figure out how do we transfer your records from the hospital stay so that the doctor can review them before your visit and they can answer the questions appropriately. Myself as a physician can review the medications and can say, hey, you are kind of, you're on a medication right now. The anti-seizure, the seizure medication really seems to be uh, known to cause a lot of sleepiness. 
I'm really sus suspicious that this is the reason why your mother is so tired, why she's so tired. And so as a physician, I could place a referral to neurology, citing that I want a consultation because I have a strong suspicion that the seizure medication is causing the drowsiness, and I would like to stop the medication but wanted to just double check to make sure there's not other follow-up testing and plans that need to be done um, prior to discontinuation. Other ways to make the, uh, so what's also recommended to make the most of his office is, is during the office visit, confirm the, uh, the, the prioritization and what are needed actions that need to take place. Um, I have had uh, some of my patients actually uh, come in with their notes that they've taken on their tablet just to, con just to uh, confirm and to take notes, uh, to confirm the prioritization and to take notes regarding the action plan. Uh, we want to make sure that we allow time for clear reporting of symptoms and maximize our uh, elders' participation at the office visit. And also confirmation of recommendations. Uh, I am now utilizing more the tools of the internet to provide educational links either as a video or as rep, uh, good websites to say, you know, these are ways that you can um, uh, learn about, let's say, for example, uh, dietary changes for management of blood pressure uh, that are probably better done and that can be presented easier uh, more than what I can do as a physician in the 15-minute office visit. And then confirm a follow-up. So in this scenario, this is how the visit could go. Yourself and your mother will come into the visit. You confirm the agenda. The doctor shares with you that he's already re uh, reviewed, uh, he or she has already reviewed um, the records and found out that there was a recommendation from the prior hospitalization that there will be a blood test uh, be done and that this has been ordered. You and your mother then ask your questions regarding the hospitalization. They are answered. Your mother also verbalizes her sleepiness concerns as best as she's able, and you provide some corroborative information as to, uh, besides sleepiness, if there are any other symptoms that are going along uh, with the sleepiness that could explain a, a, another possible reason as to why this may be occurring. Physical exam is complete, and the doctor lets you know that there is an online video available to review on diet and hypertension and has added this link on your discharge instructions, which also can be accessed, again, at, at your own convenience at home through the patient-physician portal. So you confirm at the visit, at the end, that number one, a neurology appointment has been placed, that there is blood work to be done. You currently don't have time to actually review the video in the office visit. This is the reason why we sometimes don't move the patients out of the office is because some of our patients, we try to uh, provide information to them through the computer. And so some of my patients say, I want to review this video before I leave your office, rather than saying I want to take home. But in this situation, the scenario, let's just say that you as a caregiver can say, I currently don't have time to review this, but go ahead and send me the link and I'll review the video at home. And then, you're not able to make a follow-up appointment because you're, you're not quite sure exactly what your schedule looks like uh, one month uh, from the time of the uh, visit. So you tell the physician, I'd like to bring my mom back in a month's time. Everyone agrees that that seems to be a reasonable follow-up plan, but you're not exactly sure what day or time you actually have available in that one month. Finally, to make the most of the office visit, of course, is the after our office visit. Make sure to review the plans and recommendations that are, again, in, in many instances, available to you uh, through an online portal. Review any kind of, uh, review any links or um, uh, videos that are sent to you uh, by the provider. Make sure to, of course, discuss the visit with the elder and others uh, that may be involved or responsible in care of your loved one. Make sure to make any needed medication changes. And then you can always contact the provider if for follow-up questions or concerns, uh, again, through either email or through electronic messaging. And then, of course, update your calendar for the next visit. 
So in close of this scenario, after the office visit, you review the video at home and you start some of the dietary changes after your mother's approval. You were still unclear as to whether the seizure medication still was to be stopped before or after that neurology appointment, and you messaged the doctor uh, for clarification. And then you can then use the same online portal to schedule a follow-up visit. So that's a uh, summary of how some of these office visits uh, may be heading uh, in the future in terms of trying to maximize the time, that the limited time that you have uh, between the three, the three of you as the dementia care triad. Okay, so I'm going to move on to discussing just some of the recommendations that you should consider in the daily care needs of your loved one. As you probably already know, have a routine schedule at, uh, as best as you can, uh, but allow some flexibility. You do want to schedule um, non-daily tasks like doctor's visits during times when your loved one is more uh, most alert and refreshed. Uh, I have a patient that comes to see me with dementia on a regular basis, and I know when um, her daughter brings her into the clinic because uh, when she's doing her alert time, because we always end our visit with a dance. <laughs> Other times, um, I know when she's brought in a little too early because she's sleeping. <laughs> Make sure to take time during daily activities and care, and don't rush. You know, expect that frequent breaks will be needed. Expect that you might not get through with the agenda that you may have in terms of the daily care activities. But take the time and expect that it will, uh, tasks will take longer and that there will be breaks that will be needed. If possible, involve your loved one to do as much as possible with the least amount of assistance. So, for, and this could be, uh, for example, um, setting out the clothes uh, on the bed, uh, but then being on hand in case your loved one needs help dressing, or sit, having your loved one uh, s finish setting up the table after you've already arranged one place setting. Those are some examples about how you can uh, help them stay active and participatory with the least amount of assistance. And then also make sure, as was has mentioned before, to have, as best as you can, a safe living environment. There are different things that you may need to do depending on the loved one you're caring for. Options I have recommended to some of my um, caregivers uh, have been uh, for uh, their loved ones that still would like to cook to help make sure to be around when they're cooking, and if not, then to take the knobs off the stoves and ovens to make it so there's not a safety uh, risk. Uh, making sure that safety devices, uh, like fire alarms and extinguishers, are working, and um, uh, keeping uh, walk wheels well lit um, uh, at night, especially when there is uh, worsening issues with disorientation. For yourself, make sure to take care of yourself, all right? It's very important. Eat a healthy, balanced diet. Try to exercise 30 minutes at least five days a week. If you're not already doing this, start off slow. Don't injure yourself. And consider including your loved one in the exercise that you're doing. Walks are great. Walks are great. If you get an offer for help in care, say yes. As mentioned already, make sure that you do one thing for yourself every day that you enjoy, that you find joy in. And then as, when you can, get sleep. Given the time of year two, my also strong recommendation uh, is my plug to you, get your flu shot, all right? If your loved one is homebound, you know, they're not going to get the flu unless you bring it to them, right? Right? Or, or they're not going to get the flu unless you bring it to them or a visitor does it. So yourself, if you can, if you haven't done so this year, get your flu shot. Uh, and or make sure to get all of the, um, the routine visitors who come and see your loved one at their homebound to get their flu shots so you can protect them from getting the flu. So let's go and move on to what I mean by the dementia care team and identify the potential team members. So we have already talked about the current most common team that we see is this dementia care triad. But we now know that the better model really is a true multidisciplinary team effort rather than just, again, the elder or loved one 
caregiver, and physician, okay? Team-based care is a strategic redistribution of work among members of our practice team using each team member's strengths, okay? In the model, in this model, if it works well, all members of the team play an integral role in providing the patient care. It's usually led by physician, but not always, all right? And all team members share responsibilities and work together towards better care. So we know that at least the three members of this team should be, of course, the elder, the caregiver, and the primary care medical practitioner. But who are some other team members that you think should be involved, possibly included in care of your loved one? Is it, yes? Family. Family, other family members. Right. Good. Anyone else that should be part of the team? Pharmacist. Pharmacist. Perfect. Anyone else that, should, that can be part of the team? Physical therapist. Physical therapist. Perfect. All right. We've got a lot of lists here. These are some of the uh, ones I've kind of generated off the top of my head. Uh, other primary care medical practitioners, nursing, specialty care, we'll go over that, what I mean by that, social worker, dietitian, case managers, pharmacists, home health agencies, visiting dental professionals, and many, many more. One thing that I will ask of you as caregivers that are here, as one of your primary roles, at least for me as a physician, is please, please teach us. Teach the physician what you have learned in your journey as being a caregiver. Let me give an example. I had a caregiver come and tell me, Dr. Lin, my mom needs a chair. I was going, okay, so your mom needs a wheelchair, right? She said, no, my mom needs a chair. I was going, okay, um, what do you mean by a chair? And so she said, can I, can I get you off the computer for a second? <laughs> kind of moved, moved me over and Googled what she was trying to tell me she wanted and or needed. And what she actually wanted was a transport chair, not a wheelchair. And I said, uh, I had no idea what this was. I actually, in my training uh, as both a resident and a fellow, I was never taught what a transport chair was. So what a transport chair, as probably many of you do know, is that it is, is a very light, lightweight chair that is used primarily for transporting an elder who has limited mobility, right? So you can see there's a difference in terms of the size of the wheels. There's a difference in terms of the weight. There's a significantly lightweight. And so if I didn't learn from the caregiver what she wanted, I would have ordered the wrong equipment. And as you, I hope you haven't experienced this, but as you know, or may not know, if you've delivered something and you accept it, you can't return it back. So that was very good that she let me know, because otherwise I would have ordered the wrong thing. It would have been delivered. She would have gotten something that she couldn't use. And, and on top of that, I could not have then put in another order for a transport chair for at least five years, because that's how long it takes for Medicare to approve medical, uh, not approve, but how long you can get a new device to satisfy the, um, the previous need, okay? So teach us, if you know something that we're giving you the question like, what are you talking about? Teach, teach the physician, please. Other primary care medical practitioners that you may want to list the help of. This is my doctor's bag. I actually still do home visits, okay? Um, it, if you, one of the things you probably should ask your, um, your loved one's physician is, is there anyone in the practice that does home visits that can maybe come out and help give us some advice or opinions about care of the loved one uh, there? I still do home visits. So for example, uh, I had a resident who uh, paged me saying, I'm being asked to fill this paperwork in order for uh, this bedbound elder who has dementia uh, to get a hospital bed, okay? But the way that the, guy, the Medicare requirements are is that you can't order that without a face-to-face -face visit from a doctor. So, so how is the bedbound elder supposed to, and she lived about 25 miles away, supposed to get to the doctor's office to get the face-to-face -face visit to get the hospital bed? So since the resident in my, uh, training program knew that I do home visits, she basically paged me and said, Dr. Lin, can you go see this, my patient, so then that they can get their hospital bed. 
I drove over to the patient's home uh, at about five o'clock, did the visit that was necessary for qualifications of the older, and was able to get the patient, um, uh, the elder, their hospital bed uh, within a couple of weeks. So, one th so those are other primary care medical practitioners to have in mind. I'm gonna move quickly though through the rest of my presentation here. Other colleagues, as mentioned, social workers, pharmacists, okay. So remember that your dementia care triad should really be a dementia care team, okay. So when you visit your loved one's physician as, a, as in the role of caregiver, ask, figure out what resources are available uh, in the clinic or readily available for that practice. So for our practice, I can tell you that we have, as I mentioned, a very small home visit service that I lead. We have nursing. We have access to specialty care. One of the slides I missed was what I mean by that is that, for example, uh, we can ask our dermatologist to look at pictures that we send them so then that the, the, the patient does not need to go to the dermatologist's office necessarily to get a diagnosis. We can just send them so they've not, not a need for a second visit to see the dermatologist, as an example. In our clinic, we also have uh, access, but not personal access to a social worker. Dietitian, again, access, but not personal access to a case manager. And we actually have actually a, a team of pharmacists and a pharmacy clinic uh, in our family practice clinic here at UC Davis. So ask, ask if there are other team members that are available that can join the team. So let's review what are the current challenges and future possibilities in the care of the elder with dementia. We've already discussed that the main, one of the main issues with any team care approach is going to be the problem with time. And as we discussed, uh, this is a, a elephant in the room problem because this is based on how care is reimbursed that's been set at the federal government level since the uh, 1990s, might have been the 80s, I'm sorry about that. Um, so that's, that's something that we just need to be cautious and careful about is, 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 is the, the, the time factor. Um, so we already discussed about ways that we can try to circumvent that challenge in utilizing technology to do pre-visit work prior to a doctor's office visit. We also know that a major challenge is ongoing lack of financial support for caregivers as I think raised the hands of that many of you who are providing care are being, uh, are providing care uncompensated. You're not being paid for the care that you're providing, right? Uh, in in, in, in um, Sacramento, uh, your options can be maybe in-home support services, veterans programs, but very, uh, there's really other, you know, very few other access points where you can financially be reimbursed for uh, what's, uh, for the care that you're providing. We also know, as already been dis uh, discussed so wonderfully today, about the problems with, with uh, caregiver stress, right? Uh, besides the financial challenges that we have in caregiving, um, there are also many other symptoms that can develop with caregiving, including depression, withdrawal, uh, insomnia, or just a few. What's one possible good news item, and uh, I hate to say this, but I've, well, sorry, I'm throwing my political stripes here, but there actually has been something positive from Dr. Uh, from uh, President Trump's signature. Um, there was uh, just passed this year a bipartisan um, act. Uh, have any one of you heard of this, the Raised Caregiver Act? Okay, so there was an act that was signed into law January 2018 called the Recognize, Assist, Include, Support, and Engage or Raise Family Caregiver Act, and this law basically tasked the Secretary of Human, uh, Health and Human Services to establish a national plan to how we are going to support family caregivers. And they're supposed to give us their recommendations within 18 months. So sometime in the summer of next year, there should be some policies that are coming out from the federal government and from each subsequent levels of government what policies should be in place to help support caregivers. And this plan is to be also, it's been tasked in the law that it also is not just a plan that, that is over with and done in 18 months. It's required by law that the plan be updated once a year. We don't know what that's going to look like, 
we need to wait to see what the recommendations are, but just be aware that, that we should hopefully start seeing some results of, of that law that's been enacted. And then the last piece I wanna just say is the following, is to go over really quickly the future possibilities in caregiving. One of the things that we are starting to see what, if we could do this here at UC Davis is to do video um, visits um, with caregivers at their home. <clears throat> so the physician would be here in the office and then we could uh, 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 do the uh, virtual visit with uses of also technologies to help us out. Uh, uh, the, the top picture is one of a portable EKG monitor that you can now use with a smartphone. The bottom is one that we're using for pediatrics, but it is a portable um, stethoscope that can determine if a child is wheezing or not and can actually diagnose whether or not a child has asthma based on the, uh, the algorithm that the stethoscope has built into it. Other things that, have, that we know is probably gonna need to happen is that an increase in the number of professionals that do home visits because more and more of our loved ones are, are uh, you know, becoming homebound, have difficulty leaving the home. It's been estimated that the number of homebound patients, uh, excuse me, the homebound uh, people uh, currently uh, uh, are higher than the number of individuals that are staying in skilled nursing facilities. Technology can also be in place for support of the loved one at home in terms of making sure they're as safe as possible. Um, activity detection, like determining did your loved one fall in the home or not. Uh, there are monitors for that. There are monitors to determine are they still sleeping in, 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 in their bed. Uh, the item on the right is a medication dispensing device, not available to market yet. I believe it's supposed to come out next year uh, that can help dispense medications uh, to your loved one. It basically rings, lets them know, uh, and, and, and it says with your voice if you want to say, oh, please remember to take your medication. It dispenses the medication, and if the medication is not taken out of the dispenser, it will actually call you, the doctor or the physician, that the medication hasn't been taken. And you can then send a video um, uh, message to your loved one on the other side to remind them uh, that a medication needs to be taken. So I am out of time here, so thank you. I uh, Hopefully we've been able to touch base on these uh, four items today with reviewing the, how best to make the most of your office visit. Uh, review recommendations uh, for daily care. Um, introduced the idea about making it more than just a dementia care triad, but a dementia care team. And then also just be aware of the ongoing challenges and what are the future possibilities. And thank you. <laughs>